the Alps, Europe's majestic wonderland. Yet deep inside lies one of the world's longest road tunnels. Daily it carries thousands of motorists in safety. Until an ordinary lorry explodes into flames. The tunnel turns into a terrifying death trap in just 14 minutes. Now with cutting edge computer technology, we reveal exactly what went wrong. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel those fateful decisions in the final seconds from disaster. Europe, France, Mont Blanc. March 24th, 1999, 10.30 a.m. The world's deepest tunnel, cut through solid rock, lies 2,478 meters beneath Mont Blanc, Europe's highest mountain. It's a vital road link between France and Italy, one favored by truck drivers, especially as it shortens their journey time from seven hours to only 15 minutes, and saves the climb through winding mountain roads. More than 5,000 vehicles use the tunnel every day, including tourists, locals, and lorries. It's a fine spring morning as British trucker John Whitby heads for the toll on the Italian side. As you come up through the mountains towards the uh, tunnel entrance, it's very picturesque, and then there's this little black hole in the side of the mountain. Prior to this particular day, I'd always been quite happy to go through the tunnels. Some use the tunnel for pleasure. Extreme skier Nicolas Borghi is heading from his home in Italy to the ski slopes of France. That day, the snow conditions were perfect. It is my passion to ski off piste. We packed our ski boots and all our other gear in the car and drove towards the tunnel. When we got there, we paid our tolls and entered the tunnel as we'd done a thousand times before. Normally, it takes Borghi 15 minutes to drive through the tunnel. Today's journey would be different. Surely it's always dangerous to cross a tunnel, but nothing had ever happened before. And we wish you a pleasant trip. As Borghi and Whitby drive through the tunnel from Italy to France, two independent control rooms monitor their progress. One on the Italian side, and one on the French side. Up until now, it's just another day in the tunnel. A tunnel that has carried more than 45 million vehicles since it opened in 1965. A remarkable feat of engineering. It took four years to blast through the solid rocks in the Alps to create one of the longest road tunnels in the world. And one of the safest. Eighteen fire refugees are spaced every 600 meters throughout the tunnel. There are 77 emergency telephones with a dedicated rescue team at the French end and volunteer rescuers at the Italian end. Until the 24th of March 1999, it's free of major incidents. The teams have dealt with all previous lorry fires without major casualties. But all this is about to change. Ten forty-six a.m. A forty-ton refrigerated lorry arrives at the toll booth on the French side of the tunnel. Just one of the two thousand lorries that use the tunnel every day. Behind the wheel is Gilbert de Grave, a fifty-seven-year-old Belgian driver with twenty-five years' experience. Ten forty-seven. He enters the tunnel and reaches sixty kilometers per hour.
refrigerated Volvo lorry is carrying an everyday load, nine tons of margarine and 12 tons of flour, destined for a food factory in Milan. Other lorries and cars enter the tunnel behind him. As always, 40 closed circuit TV cameras monitor the progress of all vehicles. 10.49. De Graaf's lorry has been in the tunnel for two minutes, but neither he nor the closed circuit TV cameras can yet pick up the first signs of trouble. White smoke is escaping from behind his cab. De Graaf's lorry is now more than 2,400 meters underground and over two kilometers into the tunnel. Unaware of the smoke, he continues on his journey. 10.50. The smoke increases. De Graaf is nearing the middle of the tunnel. Nine sensors run the length of the tunnel. They feed information on the visibility to control rooms at either end. When visibility is reduced by 30%, it triggers an alarm. But the smoke billowing from de Graaf's lorry is not that dense yet. At last, de Graaf does notice. I looked at my side mirrors. I saw some smoke at the right side, but not much. So I drove on normally. It's 10.51. De Grave is five kilometers into the French side, and the situation is now far from normal. Oncoming cars and lorries can clearly see smoke from behind the cab. It passes under the trailer and swirls up towards the roof of the tunnel. More and more drivers realize something is seriously wrong. They try to get De Grave's attention. 10.52. Now the smoke is dense enough to trigger the tunnel sensors. These raise an alarm in the French control room, but not the Italian one, as it's been turned off because of a false alarm the previous day. False alarms are not uncommon. At this stage, only the French tunnel operator hears the alarm, but doesn't know its cause. Meanwhile, the entrance tolls to the tunnel remain open. Vehicles continue to enter from both ends. Finally, Gilbert de Grave can ignore the smoke no longer. As I drive, the smoke is increasing. I put on my hazard lights to warn the people behind and avoid an accident. It's 10.53. He brings his lorry to a halt. He's six kilometers in, the halfway point of the Mont Blanc tunnel. I stopped slowly. I got out of the truck and the smoke was much more noticeable. A queue quickly forms behind him. I tried to grab hold of the extinguisher, but I didn't have time because the whole cabin was in flames. Suddenly, it explodes. De Grave abandons his lorry and runs towards Italy. Driving towards him on the other side of the road is the Italian skier Nicolas Borghi. I was halfway through the tunnel when I saw a glow far away. Then when I was 20 meters away, I saw a massive flame and the truck driver running away. The queue behind De Grave's lorry is growing. 38 men and women are stuck in their vehicles. None of them can see the danger ahead. But John Whitby, who's coming from the opposite direction, can. We looked down the tunnel and couldn't see anything but blackness. But what we didn't know at that point was that, that blackness was actually thick smoke. And that thick smoke is rapidly enveloping the vehicles stuck behind De Graves' lorry. Within seconds, the road tunnel will turn into a raging inferno.
lorry traveling from France to Italy in the Mont Blanc tunnel stops and erupts into flame. A line of vehicles comes to a halt behind it. Alarms trigger in the tunnel's control rooms. But operators do not yet realize the seriousness of the situation and continue to allow vehicles to enter the tunnel from its two entrances in France and Italy. Ten fifty-four. The lorry's been on fire for one minute. Someone in the tunnel sees the smoke and uses the emergency phone at Refuge Twenty-Two, three hundred meters from the lorry, to raise the alarm. It rings through to the Italian control room. The operator there gets his first direct information that there's a serious problem. Immediately, the Italian and French controllers speak to each other. Now they can clearly see the smoke on their monitors, but they can't see the lorry. It's hidden by the smoke. Realizing the danger, they close the tunnel to new vehicles at both sides. But for the 25 vehicles and 38 people who've already followed De Graaf's lorry into the tunnel, it's too late. They're either driving towards the lorry, or they're already stuck behind it. Ten fifty-six. By now, thick black smoke is moving over the first of the vehicles trapped behind the lorry, back towards France. But ahead of the flaming lorry towards Italy, the smoke is spreading more slowly. Drivers coming from that direction include Nicolas Borghi. I myself and the cars behind me were able to reverse till we reached a layby where we could do a U-turn and head towards the exit. In the Italian control room, an operator sees the fleeing vehicles and pumps fresh air in towards them. But this increased airflow moves through the tunnel towards the fire and on to France. When air hits fire, it's a problem. Like Borghi, John Whitby is also trying to escape. He stops 300 meters from the inferno. But the tunnel is too narrow for his lorry to turn. He has no choice but to abandon it. As he does, he looks back on the trapped vehicles. There must have been a lot of people that just did not stand a, a chance at all. That um, must have been absolutely horrifying for them. As Whitby makes his escape, the fire is burning fiercely, producing more and more thick black smoke. Ten fifty-seven. The fire has been raging for just four minutes, yet the killer smoke has already covered almost half a kilometer on its way towards France. The alarm reaches the tunnel's rescue team stationed at the French entrance. A four-man team prepares to go in. Ten fifty-eight. The wall of smoke from the epicenter of the fire obscures the view of the closed-circuit TV cameras. And as the French rescue team enter the tunnel, they don't know that thirty-eight people are stuck in their vehicles behind the lorry. For the drivers, the situation is horrific. The visibility is reduced to half a meter. Panicked, some try to drive away. But the lack of oxygen kills their engines and their only means of escape. In desperation, some try to get to refuges, specially designed fireproof rooms located every 600 meters. But their quest is futile. It's a living nightmare. <laughs> 
and most of those trapped are unconscious within minutes. It's now 11 o'clock. As the scale of the catastrophe grows, firefighters from the French town of Chamonix scramble to enter the tunnel. But they manage to travel less than four kilometers before their vehicle is engulfed by the wall of smoke. Unable to turn it around, they're forced to abandon it and seek shelter in a maintenance room where they'll remain for five hours. Still no emergency services managed to reach the center of the blaze. Now the first rescuers enter from the Italian side, where the smoke is spreading more slowly. John Whitby is stilled by his lorry when he sees them. The wail of sirens came down the tube, and they screamed past us um, down into the darkness ahead. And um, they were sort of swallowed up by the smoke, actually. The Italian volunteer rescuers get within 300 meters, but one patrolman gets within 10 meters of the lorry before a new danger forces them all to turn back. There were six explosions in rapid succession, which were just bang, 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 uh, very quick, and they were very powerful explosions. Tires from the vehicles explode. They send deadly shrapnel flying. tunnel wall shook with the, with the force of the explosion. Within a, a minute of minute or two of that happening, the fire brigade were back. As they retreat, the Italians rescue John Whitby and other drivers. Among them is Gilbert de Grave, the driver of the lorry that starts the inferno. They exit the tunnel on the Italian side. They've all made a miraculous escape. It's 11-11. Italian firefighters enter the tunnel to try to tackle the blaze. Leading them is fire chief Dionisi Glari. We could see in the distance a wall of smoke that we tried to penetrate with our vehicle. But again, the smoke is too thick, and Glari and his team are forced to retreat. They seek shelter in refuge number 24, one of the tunnel's fireproof rooms, where they'll be safe for two hours. But for these firefighters, the drama isn't over. They receive word about some colleagues who are trapped, but where? Bravely, Glari and his team leave the safety of Refuge 24 and head out into the smoke to try to find them. We were walking in the tunnel with one hand along the wall so as to find our way. Reaching the next refuge, we entered, looked around and found there was no one there. The conditions worsen, and after 10 minutes, the firefighters are forced back to Refuge 24 to find to their disbelief that the smoke-proof room now offers them little protection. We saw smoke coming from the ventilation vents that should send clean air into the refuge. With their breathing apparatus running on empty, they're desperately short of air. Outside, the operation commander hatches a plan. The trapped firefighters are told that beneath the road is a ventilation duct full of fresh air which may offer a means of escape. The problem is finding the door without getting lost in the smoke. To reach this doorway we had to use an electrical extension lead that we tied to the door of the refuge and then went to look for the doorway. At the same time, more Italian firefighters are sent in through the ventilation duct to try to open the door from below. The moment they opened that door, that was the moment I glimpsed a possibility of escape. 
The rescuers become the rescued. After three hours, Glory and his team are able to escape through the ventilation duct. But what they don't know is that 38 people are still trapped inside a tunnel where temperatures reach over 1,000 degrees. Eleven thirty. Thirty-seven minutes after the lorry erupts in flames, the dense, deadly smoke now stretches more than six kilometers, filling the tunnel all the way to the French exit. Firefighters abandon all efforts to attack the flames. No one in the tunnel has a chance of survival. Such is the ferocity of the fire that it burns for 53 hours. Only then can firefighters pick their way through the charred debris. They're horrified to discover the remains of the 38 trapped people. These pictures reveal the true extent of the horror. Those who survive, like Nicholas Borgi, are astonished at the fire's ferocity. More shocking is that the heat had melted the steel in the lorries. You could only see the basis of the lorries, the skeleton. What could have happened to those poor people left in there? The disaster takes everyone by surprise. How could such a catastrophe occur here? How could an ordinary lorry carrying an ordinary load of margarine and flour end up causing one of the worst road tunnel disasters on record? From the moment the lorry enters the tunnel, it takes just 14 minutes for 38 people to perish. Now we rewind the events of that fateful day and go deep into the investigation to reveal what really happened. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. A team of experts is assembled to investigate the fire. Using their data, we can piece together the deadly chain of events to find out what caused this terrible tragedy. The first mystery facing the experts is what starts the fire in the lorry. They trace the lorry's journey on its approach to the tunnel. This is where problems could first occur. Lorries frequently overheat on the long climb up to the tunnel entrance. Investigators examine the remains of the Volvo lorry. Is there a fault with the FH-12 engine? After intensive tests, they find no conclusive evidence of overheating. Then, a breakthrough. The investigators find particles inside the engine that can only have got there if the air filter had burnt before the main fire. But how could the air filter have burnt first? One theory is that a casually discarded cigarette from a passing vehicle enters the lorry's air filter on top of the cabin. The cigarette travels down to the filter, which catches fire. Particles then enter the engine, causing that to catch fire and thus starting the blaze. It's a strong possibility. Investigators then carry out an experiment on a similar lorry in similar conditions. Although not conclusive, it proves a cigarette butt entering the air filter could cause a fire. But that in itself is not enough to cause a tragedy on the scale of the Mont Blanc tunnel fire. So how did this small fire turn into a raging inferno? Deep in the Mont Blanc tunnel, a mine of fire suddenly goes out of control. In 14 minutes, 38 people perish. 
Using advanced computer graphics based on the official reports, we go deep into the investigation to unravel the chain of deadly events. Investigators believe it starts with a small fire smoldering in the engine beneath the cab. 14 minutes from disaster, de Grave enters the tunnel. But the fire only erupts after he stops and abandons his vehicle. Could the movement of air prevent the fire taking hold? Experts know that lorry fires can develop more quickly when vehicles slow down or stop because then the supply of oxygen increases which feeds the fire. Ed Galea is a fire expert. There was a recent example where a, um, a bus had caught fire in an alpine tunnel and the bus driver continued driving, managed to get the vehicle through the tunnel um, to the other side, managed to evacuate the vehicle and then the bus erupted into flames. Perhaps if de Grave had continued driving, he could have made it to the end of the tunnel before the fire flared up. But he didn't. Seven minutes from disaster, he stops halfway through the tunnel. Almost immediately, the lorry bursts into flames. But why did it spread so quickly? Underneath the refrigerated trailer, just meters from the flames, are the lorry's diesel tanks. Investigators realize that in previous lorry fires, diesel is a contributing factor. Did diesel from de Grave's lorry fuel the fire? Didier Lacroix has studied hundreds of fires and knows where to look. The difference between this fire and the 17 fires that had occurred before was that it started very quickly. They spread to 34 vehicles. But Lacroix discovers that de Grave's lorry is only carrying 550 liters of diesel. His tank is only half full. It can't explain the rapid spread of the fire. Lacroix digs deeper. He re-examines every second of the lorry's journey from the moment it enters the tunnel. His team turned their attention to the contents of the refrigerated trailer. It's only carrying 9 tons of margarine and 12 tons of flour, a seemingly harmless load. They're not even classified as dangerous goods. But with little else to go on, they begin to experiment with the cargo. One of the things we discovered was that goods that are not classified officially as dangerous can lead to a very serious fire. Here, a simple demonstration shows how one ton of margarine simulates the cargo. It's wrapped in polystyrene sheets, the same insulation material lining the refrigerated trailer. After just two minutes, it proves to be a highly combustible combination. In refrigerated vans, you have polyurethane. And when this burns, it produces a, a lot of heat. It burns, it can burn very rapidly. Now, when the margarine melts due to the fire, it's an oil-based material, and it will also rapidly burn, producing quite a lot of heat. Margarine has a very high energy content. Incredibly, when it's melted, it's almost as dangerous as petrol. Our experiment shows how dangerous things can be in the open air. But fire experts know that in the confines of tunnels, fires burn much more intensely because there are limited outlets for the heat to escape. To find out more, this research facility is conducting large-scale fire tests in a disused road tunnel in Norway. Simulated trailers with various loads are set alight. The purpose of the tests is to investigate the heat generated by lorries carrying typical loads, such as packing crates and furniture. These experiments produce the world's highest heat release rating ever recorded in a tunnel fire test. But is margarine even more flammable? 
The Mont Blanc team calculates that the burning load of margarine may have created an even higher heat rating. The intensity of the fire on March 24, 1999 takes everyone by surprise, including Mont Blanc tunnel expert Jean Martinetti. The fire reached between 1,000 and 1,200 degrees. Nothing could withstand it. Everything melted, the ground, the concrete, the structure. It was completely unthinkable, a real crematorium. Investigators are shocked that such a simple cargo of margarine and flour, not classified as dangerous, could produce a fire almost as powerful as a 30,000 litre petrol tanker. But 14 other lorries are stuck in an 800 metre queue behind the first burning lorry. Could these have contributed to the fire? The second truck was also carrying margarine. There were two trucks carrying large quantities of polyethylene. The combined firepower of these lorries burning together takes the inferno to another unimaginable level of horror for the 38 people trapped in the tunnel. Uh, the vehicles that were involved in the fire had the energy content um, equivalent of about five to seven petrol tankers full of fuel. But for these vehicles to contribute to the inferno, the fire first had to spread to them. So how did that happen? Three explanations emerge. First, the burning truck radiates heat and generates hot gases that in the confines of a tunnel can ignite vehicles a great distance from the fire. Another way is that uh, the vehicle that's on fire is leaking fuel and it runs along the length of the tunnel. Yet another way is if the fire is very intense, your road surface itself catches fire, and then that will ignite the other vehicles in the tunnel. Investigators are not able to prove which of the three methods causes the fire to spread, but they do make another discovery. Fire is not the real killer. We found out later that people died in the cars before they could even open the doors and get out. So if fire is not the killer, what is? A smouldering lorry enters the Mont Blanc tunnel. The driver stops and suddenly his truck explodes into flames. Investigators know that the driver manages to escape the inferno by running towards Italy. But 38 motorists behind his lorry back towards France perish. Why? Investigators focus on the smoke given off by the fire. Without realizing it, John Whitby is a witness to this deadly wall of smoke. All we could see ahead was blackness about 200 meters from where we were stopped. Um, it was just completely dark. Uh, we presumed that it was just lack of lighting, um, but it actually turned out to be the smoke from the fire. Seven minutes from disaster, Data gathered from the sensors in the tunnel reveal that in these minutes, smoke travels 800 meters over the 25 gridlocked vehicles. The smoke travels at 4.5 meters per second. That's more than 16 kilometers per hour, creating a sudden loss of visibility down to half a meter. It means the trapped drivers have only seconds to decide whether to try to reach safety of a refuge or remain in their vehicles. People probably believe that uh, they're safe in their vehicle that the smoke is not going to be too much of a problem, that the fire will be brought under control and they might as well stay in their, in their car. Four minutes to go. In the middle of the smoke, four cars do attempt to turn round. The tunnel is wide enough, so why don't they make it? 
Experts know that car engines need oxygen to work. The fire is consuming the oxygen and replacing it with carbon monoxide. Starved of oxygen, the vehicle's engines splutter and die. There's no way out. The fate for those who abandon their vehicles is equally bleak. They're overcome by smoke and other toxic gases before they reach the safe areas. Analysis of the scene reveals that the smoke contains cyanide, a gas that no one can survive. The smoke fills the French half of the tunnel so rapidly that none of the 38 trapped people stands a chance. It's impossible for even the fittest individual to outrun. Fourteen minutes after the lorry enters the tunnel, everyone in the tail bag behind the truck has perished. Investigators now turn their attention to why the deadly smoke moves towards France. Normally, airflow in the tunnel is the other way, towards Italy. They discover that weather conditions play a key role. The day of the fire, there were rather unusual weather conditions that happened maybe 20 days a year, with a wind going from Italy to France, and this airflow clearly brought smoke towards France. But Lacroix is not convinced this is the only cause. He knows the tunnel operators can also dramatically affect the airflow using the tunnel's ventilation system. Gigantic fans in plant rooms at both ends enable the operators to supply or extract air through ducts running beneath the road. Normal operation requires ducts to supply air, but in the event of fire, duct 5 is supposed to be set to remove the smoke. Did operators carry out the correct emergency procedure? Jean Martinetti has studied the official reports and knows the tunnel inside out. He's shocked by what he learns. When the fire occurred, on the Italian side, according to the reports, the Italian operator blew fresh air in instead of extracting it a soufflé de l'air frais au lieu de l'aspirer. The Italian tunnel operator sees motorists attempting to turn around. To aid their escape, he adjusts the ventilation settings and pumps in fresh air. The disruption of normal airflow plays a major role in the disaster. Although the air blown in from Italy undoubtedly saves some lives, including John Whitby's. I realized how lucky I was. 90% um, of the time, the smoke come, would have come the other way to, to Italy, and I wouldn't be here now. But the air being pumped in from Italy moves the smoke towards France at a terrifying speed. After enveloping the vehicles trapped behind the burning lorry, the smoke accelerates, now moving at six meters per second. On the French side, the whole French half of the tunnel was filled with smoke in little over half an hour. Approaching the fire was now impossible from either end of the tunnel. And all rescue attempts are called off. But a startling discovery is about to be made. A fire in the Mont Blanc tunnel between France and Italy becomes one of the worst road tunnel fires ever. A critical chain of events causes the disaster. And now investigators find the final link to that chain. Throughout the whole rescue, none of the emergency teams or tunnel operators were aware of the 38 trapped motorists. 
The closed circuit TV cameras were so quickly blocked by the smoke, it was impossible for the tunnel operators to see them. Information is limited. Emergency telephones only work intermittently, and sensors that detected smoke were not adequate. In fact, one was even turned off the day before the fire. Worse still, there was no communication between the French and Italian rescuers. Even firefighters become trapped. It was a totally uncoordinated effort. Tackling a fire of this severity seems to take everyone by surprise. One of the serious problems we discovered during the investigation was that over 34 years of operation, there had only been one fire drill that had involved public fire brigades. It might explain why it's more than three hours after the fire begins that the last of the trapped Italian firefighters, Glari and his team, are brought out through the underground ventilation ducts. They were absolutely black. You couldn't see the colour of the helmets or the uniforms. You couldn't see the colour of the fire engines. Everything that came out of that tunnel was black. Um, it, it was a horrible, horrible sight, really. The inferno rages for 53 hours before it's extinguished. I really hope that something is done to improve the safety of these tunnels. The disaster triggered an overhaul of safety procedures in the Mont Blanc tunnel. Today, maximum speed limits and minimum distances between vehicles are strictly enforced. Seventeen previous fires in the tunnel were caused by lorries, but now sophisticated thermal sensors at each entrance scan all lorries to detect dangerous heat emissions before they enter the tunnel. The tunnel operators have gone a long way to correct the mistakes. Many changes have been made regarding safety in the Mont Blanc tunnel. Probably one of the most important things is that now there is only one operator and using one single control center. They stage regular fire and evacuation drills. The refugees are now pressurized and fitted with a video link to the control room. Staircases now connect them directly to evacuation channels below the road. There's now a firefighting team permanently based in the center of the tunnel. And fire trucks are equipped with heat seeking systems so that they can locate people in zero visibility. March 24, 1999, provided clues that may save lives in the future. But it's small consolation for relatives of the people who died in the tunnel, including one firefighter who died from his injuries later. Xavier Chantelon will never be the same. I lost my mother-in-law, her daughter, my wife's sister, and also her fiancé. They'd all been staying with us on holiday. For relatives of the victims, like Xavier, there are still many unanswered questions regarding the final moments of those loved ones lost inside the tunnel. We still do not know for sure how they died. I'm sure I don't need to describe the horrific images I have in my head. People running about on fire or collapsing, trying to get out. You think of everything. The Mont Blanc tunnel fire and its critical chain of events reveals the dangers of deep road tunnels. On that day, a white Volvo truck enters the tunnel. A small fire under the cab gives off a stream of white smoke. The lorry stops, 
more air reaches the fire, causing it to erupt. The ordinary cargo of margarine turns deadly, creating a fire with the same potential as a 30,000 litre fuel tanker. The unusual weather conditions and incorrect use of the tunnel's ventilation system creates a wall of smoke that quickly envelops 38 trapped motorists, leaving them no chance of survival. But was this critical chain of events unique? I think there will be another fire in the Mont Blanc tunnel. Tomorrow, in six months, a year, but the emergency services are better adapted today than they were at the time of the disaster. But there will be another fire. Is another Mont Blanc disaster possible somewhere in the world? Yes, it is. Um, and it's perhaps only a matter of time. But until it happens, Millions of vehicles continue to travel through road traffic tunnels every day in safety.